Hi, welcome to Discovery of the Tau Lepton. In this video, we'll talk about the discovery of the Tau Lepton at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center using the Mark I detector in the early 1970s. The discovery of the Tau revealed that there were three families of leptons and garnered the 1995 Nobel Prize. We'll briefly discuss what the Tau lepton is, how it was produced, and how the Mark I collaboration searched for it. We'll also show how the Five Sigma criterion for discovery in particle physics, a convention for determining when a result should be called a discovery, would apply to the discovery of the Tau. Okay, so in this video, it will be helpful if you're already familiar with the Poisson distribution. For a quick introduction, you can check out the video, Why the Poisson Distribution is Important, It's Everywhere, available on this channel, or other videos in the Poisson Statistics playlist. It will also be helpful if you've already watched other videos in the Discoveries in Particle Physics playlist. Most useful of these is the video Five Sigma, the standard for discovery in particle physics. That video describes the Five Sigma convention for how an experimental result in particle physics is deemed a discovery. Okay, let's get started. Let's begin by briefly discussing the particle content of the standard model of particle physics. In the standard model, we have particles called quarks, leptons, gauge bosons, and the Higgs boson. There are six quarks and six leptons, along with their antiparticles, and the interactions among these particles are mediated by the gauge bosons. Both the quarks and the leptons are arranged into three pairs, and here I'm just showing the particles, not the antiparticles. So the quarks are the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom quarks, respectively, and the leptons are the electron, the muon, the tau, and their respective neutrinos. So the tau, the lepton in the lower right-hand corner, is the particle that we're looking at in this video. Okay, so as the tau is a lepton, let's take a brief look at the leptons. You're probably familiar with the electron, E minus. It is electrically charged with charge minus one. The tau minus, and also the mu minus, are like the electron with charge minus one, but they're heavier. Additionally, there is a neutral lepton called a neutrino for each of these charged leptons. Before the discovery of the tau, it was quite mysterious why nature would have two leptons, the electron and the muon, that appeared to be exact copies of each other except for their masses. Today we know there are three families of quarks and leptons. Except for the particle masses, these families are copies of each other. But we still don't know why nature does this. This is an active area of research. Okay, I should give a quick note about notation. When we need to distinguish a tau minus, which has a charge of minus one, from its antiparticle, which has charge plus one, we'll write it as tau minus. Its antiparticle, we'll write as tau plus. And when we mean either of them, we'll write it as tau plus or minus. Sometimes I'll refer to this as tau plus or minus, and sometimes I'll just refer to it as tau. The notation is similar for the E plus and minus and the mu plus and minus. However, like the electron E minus, 
the E plus also has its own name, the positron. And finally, antineutrinos are denoted with bars over them, so nu bar. Okay, now let's look at some of the ways that a tau interacts with other particles. Two particles that the tau can interact with are the photon, denoted gamma, and the Z boson. Let's look at those interactions first. For example, a tau can emit a photon or a Z boson. Here we show a tau minus coming in from the bottom of the screen, emitting a photon or Z, and continuing on its way. And similarly, a tau can also absorb a photon or a Z boson. A tau minus and its antiparticle tau plus can come together here from the bottom of the screen and produce a photon or a Z. And I should note that here we're using the convention that antiparticles are drawn with the directions of their arrows reversed, as you'll notice on the tau plus line. Similarly, a photon or Z can disintegrate into a tau minus and a tau plus. Okay, so we said that the three families are copies of each other except for the particle masses. So the E and the tau, charged leptons from different families, have different masses but the same interactions. In particular, the E plus or minus interacts in the same ways with the photon and the Z as the tau plus or minus does. This means we can write down an interaction where an electron and a positron collide and produce a photon or a Z, which then disintegrates into tau minus tau plus. This is how the Mark I experiment produced tau leptons. They collided electrons and positrons to produce tau minus tau plus pairs. We'll represent this process by writing E plus E minus and an arrow, which I'll read as goes to tau plus tau minus. However, it was not possible to see the tau plus tau minus pair directly. They decay too quickly to be observed. Instead, one has to identify taus by their decay products. Let's look at some ways a tau can decay. Okay, so a tau lepton can also interact with a W boson, which is a relative of the Z boson, and a tau neutrino denoted as nu sub tau. There is also a similar interaction between an electron, a W boson, and an electron antineutrino, nu E bar. We can utilize both of these in one diagram. This diagram describes a tau minus disintegrating into a tau neutrino and a W, with the W then disintegrating into an electron and an electron antineutrino. So the tau decays into a tau neutrino, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. Likewise, as the three families of leptons all have the same interactions, we can also have a similar decay, but with the electron and nu E bar in the decay products replaced with a muon and a muon antineutrino. There are also other possible decays of the tau minus, but the two that we've mentioned 
where the tau minus goes to either an E minus or a mu minus, a neutrino and an antineutrino, along with the analogous decays for the tau plus, which contain either a positron or a mu plus, are the ones relevant for the Mark I experiment. Now, let's make an important point about these decays. These four decays contain E minus, E plus, mu minus, mu plus, and neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now, the E plus and minus and mu plus and minus are particles which the detector can register. But the neutrinos and antineutrinos, for all practical purposes, do not interact with the detector. If they don't interact with the detector, we can't detect them. They are invisible. So, for example, in the decay, tau minus goes to E minus, tau neutrino, electron, antineutrino. The only visible decay product is the electron. So, in order to see the process E plus E minus goes to tau plus tau minus, using these decays, you have four options of what to look for. You could look for a positron and an electron, or a mu plus and a mu minus, or a positron and a mu minus, or a mu plus and an electron. But these four options are not all equally useful. In the standard model, there are other processes resulting from colliding an electron and a positron that can lead to an electron and a positron showing up in the detector or a mu minus and a mu plus showing up in the detector. Just like the process we're interested in, E plus E minus goes to tau plus tau minus, there are processes E plus E minus goes to E plus E minus, and E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus. So if you see E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus in your detector, it is hard to determine if you're seeing evidence for production of tau plus tau minus or not. On the other hand, in the standard model, there are no processes like E plus E minus goes to E plus mu minus or E plus E minus goes to mu plus E minus. So if you see E plus mu minus or mu plus E minus in your detector, you can have more confidence that you have tau plus tau minus production than if you saw E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus. Okay, now that we know how tau plus tau minus could be produced and a convenient decay mode to look for, let's see what the Mark I experiment did. They collided electrons and positrons. Here we'll consider only their initial observation of tau plus tau minus at the center of mass energy of 4.8 GeV. They looked for events which contained either E plus mu minus or E minus mu plus with nothing else in the detector. They placed a cut on the angle between the E plus or minus and the mu plus or minus to reduce possible contamination of their sample with events from E plus E minus goes to E plus E minus and E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus processes. They also required that the E plus or minus and mu plus or minus had momenta over a certain minimum, as this better ensured that the particles identified as E plus or minus or mu plus or minus really were E plus or minus or mu plus or minus. They kept events which passed these selection cuts and they ignored ones which did not. Now, even with these selection cuts, they still expected some background events to sneak into their sample. 
These are interactions which can happen in the detector from processes other than the one that you're interested in. These events can fool you into thinking you're seeing the process you're interested in, here, tau plus tau minus production, even when you're not. For example, an event of the process E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus could pass their selection cuts if the mu plus was mistaken for a positron or the mu minus was mistaken for an electron. There are also processes where a colliding electron and positron can produce hadrons, so these are particles made out of quarks. These hadrons could be mistaken for E plus mu minus or E minus mu plus. It could also be that hadrons are produced and one of these hadrons decays producing a muon and another decays producing an E plus or minus. Usually decays of hadrons would also leave other particles in the detector. If you insist that there be only an E plus mu minus or E minus mu plus, these events would normally be rejected by the selection. But detectors are not perfect. So if the detector fails to register these other particles, decaying hadrons which produce E plus mu minus or E minus mu plus could conceivably be mistaken for tau plus tau minus production. So even if you see events that look like they contain only E plus mu minus or E minus mu plus, that doesn't necessarily mean you've discovered tau plus tau minus production. You need to know how many background events you expect to see and compare that to the number of events which you actually see in data. Okay, here is the expected background Mark 1 calculated and how many events they actually observed in their data. So the expected background was 4.7 plus or minus 1.2 events and they actually observed 24 events. Now with an expected background of 4.7 plus or minus 1.2 events and 24 events actually showing up in their data, it is easy to believe that something other than background processes is going on in the data. Okay, now let's ask, does this observation satisfy the Five Sigma Convention for Discovery in Particle Physics? For a description of this criterion, we're going to refer to the other videos in the Discoveries in Particle Physics playlist. Here we'll just show how we check the criterion for this particular case of having an expected background of 4.7 plus or minus 1.2 events and 24 events observed. Okay, so let's assume momentarily that the tau lepton does not exist and there is nothing that could go on in the data other than background processes. This is the null hypothesis. Let's also pretend that it's the early 1970s and the experiment hasn't been carried out yet. Assuming the null hypothesis, when we do the experiment, What's the probability of observing 24 or more events? If that probability, also known as a p-value, is less than 3 times 10 to the minus 7, we say that the Five Sigma criterion is fulfilled. Okay, so the expected background is 4.7 plus or minus 1.2 events. The observed number of background events will not be the same as the expected number. 
the observed number will be Poisson distributed with a mean equal to the expected number of background events. Note that the background estimate itself has an error bar. We'll come back to this in a minute. If the expected background was 4.7 events with no error bar, the p-value calculation would be simpler. It would be the probability to observe 24 or more events if the expected background was 4.7. The probability to observe m events when lambda are expected is given by the Poisson distribution. So the probability to observe m events given an expected number lambda is equal to lambda to the m over m factorial times e to the minus lambda. So if the expected background was 4.7 events, again with no error bar, we would set lambda equal 4.7 and sum over the observed number m from 24 to infinity. So the p-value would equal the sum over m from 24 to infinity of the probability to observe m events given that lambda was equal to 4.7, which equals the sum over m from 24 to infinity of 4.7 raised to the power of m divided by m factorial times e to the minus 4.7. If we do the sum, we get the p-value approximately equal to 2.4 times 10 to the minus 10. And uh, we'll note that we can get this by doing the sum from m equals 0 to m equals 23 and subtracting that result from 1. So the p-value is approximately equal to 2.4 times 10 to the minus 10 which is much, much less than 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So if the background expectation was 4.7 events with no error bar, this result would easily satisfy the 5 sigma criterion. But the background estimate does have an uncertainty. This means that we don't know the expected background precisely. So the background was estimated to be 4.7 plus or minus 1.2 events. The Poisson probability of observing 24 events in the data will be different if the actual number of expected background events is, for example, 5.5 or 3.4. So the p-value calculation should take into account the uncertainty on the background estimate. Here, we will assume that the error on the background is Gaussian distributed. This is often approximately correct. For details, you may wish to see the playlist Mini Course on Error Bars, Measurements, and Decision Analysis. We'll get the p-value numerically with toy experiments. Each of these toy experiments is a simulation of how many events the real experiment would observe if the null hypothesis is correct. We will generate millions of these toy experiments to simulate what would happen under the null hypothesis if we ran the experiment millions of times. We'll take into account the uncertainty on the background estimate by varying the expected number of background events in each toy experiment. We will take the expected number of background events lambda as Gaussian distributed around 4.7 with a standard deviation sigma of 1.2. That Gaussian is shown here on the right. For each toy experiment, we will choose a value lambda from this distribution. We'll do this as follows. 
will randomly choose points below the curve distributed evenly in area. Each point will give us the value of lambda for one toy experiment. For example, the first 10 points might look like this. The first 100 might look like this. And the first 1000 might look like this. There are far more points toward the middle of the plot near lambda equals 4.7 than near the sides, as the curve is highest in the middle. Now, we don't need the heights of these individual points. We only care about the value of lambda on the horizontal axis. These values of lambda follow the Gaussian distribution. For example, about 68% of them will be within 1 sigma, which was 1.2, of the central value of 4.7. Now, for each toy experiment, we now have a value of the expected number of background events lambda in the null hypothesis. Now, for each toy experiment, we randomly generate an observed number of events for that toy experiment with a probability given by the Poisson distribution. Here we show the same formula as we saw before. For example, let's say one of our toy experiments has lambda equals 5.93. For this toy experiment, we randomly generate an observed number of events m. m may end up being 0, 1, 2, any integer up to infinity. The probability of getting a certain value of m for this toy experiment is given by the Poisson probability to obtain m observed events when lambda is equal to 5.93 which is equal to 5.93 raised to the power of m divided by m factorial times e to the minus 5.93. OK, so we repeat this procedure, getting a value for the observed number of events m for each toy experiment. Now remember that the real experiment, Mark 1, saw 24 events. What fraction of toy experiments will have m greater than or equal to 24? In other words, assuming the null hypothesis, what fraction of toy experiments observe as many or more events than Mark 1 actually did? This fraction is our p-value. If this number is less than 3 times 10 to the minus 7, the result from Mark 1 satisfies the 5 sigma convention. So we here at Think Like a Physicist generated 200 million toy experiments, and 15 of them had m of 24 or more. So in the null hypothesis, where only background events can show up in the detector, getting 24 or more events observed would be exceedingly rare. OK, finally, let's check the numbers. We generated 200 million toy experiments, and 15 of them had m of 24 or more. 15 divided by 200 million is equal to 7.5 times 10 to the minus 8, which is comfortably less than 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So yes, the Mark 1 result does satisfy the 5 sigma convention. OK, let's summarize. In this video, we looked at the discovery of the tau lepton by the Mark 1 collaboration at SLAC in the 1970s. They collided electrons and positrons to produce tau plus tau minus, and then looked at the case where one of their decays contains a mu plus or minus, 
and the other contains an E plus or minus. The discovery of the tau lepton revealed that there are three families of leptons, a feature of the universe which is still a current topic of research today. We also compared the observation to the Five Sigma convention for when an experimental result in particle physics qualifies as a discovery. To do this, we calculated the p-value of the observed result, taking into account the uncertainty on the background estimate. And we saw that the observation did indeed satisfy the Five Sigma criteria.